Hello, everyone, and welcome to the vlog. Today, I am beyond delighted to have with me uh, Les and Noel Kahn. And before I have them introduce themselves, I will say that I've been chatting for a few months now here and there with Les Kahn. He's been a source of inspiration for me beyond what I can say here. And I couldn't be happier to have uh, Les and Noel today in the program. I met Les through the Drunken Boxing Podcast. So from here, I want to say thank you to Byron Jacobs. And I highly recommend uh, that people check out that podcast. podcast and I put, I'll put all the information in the show notes. So with that, Les and Noel, um, could you introduce yourselves? Uh, Les will do that. <laughs> <laughs> Greetings. Um... We are just a simple couple. We've been married 34 years and um, we research and practice the martial arts. I'm from the great land of Zimbabwe and Noel is from Hong Kong. Um, I met Noel by going over to Hong Kong and spending around 25 years there. Um, we're now living in South Africa, um, giving her a chance at Africa now. So that's who we are. Uh, I'll just say to the viewers, uh, it's been good to get Noel here. She's a little less um, public than I am. And it's, uh, I'll do any of the odd questions or the quick answers, something like that. Yeah, and uh, get lost. Yeah, Noel will come in Talk wherever she can. Yeah. That's perfect. That will work very well. And Noel, just just being there, you can you can uh, inject yourself whenever you feel comfortable. But it's great to have you there. And I know from your husband that you have great experience in this topic. And so, whenever you feel comfortable, participate, please. It would be really uh, beneficial. So, Les, that was that was a great introduction. And when I when I was listening to these podcasts and then furthering our conversations, one of the things that was really striking is how your life has been proof of the depth of your research and passion for the martial arts. It's easy to render lip service to the martial arts, but you know, when someone has basically literally dedicated their lives and, and puts so much into it, it's just something that I find fascinating. And so to be honest, what we're eager to know is, is um, a little bit of that journey um, and how you got to even get interested in this and travel to the Far East and meet your wife and what happened? Ooh. Okay, well, that's a, there's a lot in there. Let's try and give you the, uh, the, the short version. Uh, I was crazy for martial arts from a very young age. And I, for whatever reason, knew that one day I'd be heading off to the Far East. It seemed to be in my destiny. And so, at around the age of 11, in fact, it was the age of 11, I started training and uh, I practiced Chinese and Japanese martial arts. And then what can I tell you? And around the age of 15, I had an experience, basically an awakening from a Zen text. And I thought, okay, now I have to connect those and I have to go overseas. I want to go to the Shaolin temple. So off, off I went to arrive in, in the Far East to discover there was no such thing. It was a rundown ramshackle place, and that wasn't going to happen. So I made an attempt to enter no, an, a, another temple, the Zen temple. And that too, as I explained on Byron's podcast, was a bit of a mess because um, I didn't find the people kind. Uh, it wasn't at all what I expected. Um, it, yeah. And besides that, also, as I said, I like girls and meat. And those are short in the Zen temple. <laughs> so uh, I, I left the temple and almost immediately met Noel. And we just faced the, the choice of what are we going to do? Because she lives there and I live far away and, and you just can't have a relationship. So that's how we met. Yeah. Noelle will tell you about her. Mm. You've been training all your life. You better tell them something. <laughs> well, um, I born and grew up in Hong Kong. And um, I think 
when I was little, most of the thing that, you know, when we play as, a, as kids, um, mostly just play, you know, if I play with my sister, it would be more like playing dolls and Jivan Zai, which is playing like cooking and things. But if we play together with boys, then we'll more, more or less we play characters in the Kung Fu movies or um, uh, like the <coughs> the more the novel of the, the, the you know, you, what you watch um, in those days, a lot of is is about um, martial art movies. Especially, especially my mom, she loves she loves uh, martial art movies. So a lot of the time we went. I remember when we were little, we watch. Uh, we went to the cinema with her to watch um, Bruce Lee and things like that. But there was yeah. So grow up with um, lots of background um, with martial art and then also just in and out training. Um, martial art in various places, whatever we can do in it. But it it just doesn't, it's, it's not like serious for us as Chinese <laughs> to, to do martial art. It's just uh, part of the life, part of life is, is martial arts and then playing and uh, yeah. So um, only after I met uh, Liz, uh, when we were married and then she asking a lot of question about cultural um, significant um, connection with martial art, which then like I'm scratching my head because it's so different from his perspective than my perspective as, as a, you know, as a young person at, in, in, the, in the beginning when we first got married. So did I go off? Yep, not perfect. <laughs> That's perfect. Yeah. Okay. That is absolutely Sorry. perfect. The point yeah. of view of something that as for me as a Westerner to mm. grow up with the mystique of mm. the Eastern arts, whereas for you, it was just something cultural you played with when you were a little girl with your with your yeah. siblings and, and friends. Very different. Right. So it's interesting. It reminds me a lot of the perception, you know, that um, even in when I, I traveled and lived in India and I went with all this expectation. Mm -hmm. that it would have this incredible mystique, right? And part of the process of growing and learning is how everything is very contextual to the culture. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a great introduction, Noel. Thank you very much for that. And Les, maybe later we'll talk about Hong Kong too, because you've told me some surprising facts about the state of practice of martial arts today in Hong Kong and how it may not be what Westerners imagine, you know, like yes. the Mecca of Kung Fu or anything like that. Perhaps it's not like that. So yeah, that's very interesting. And when you um, went then less to the Shaolin and went through clearly some sorts of ups and downs, perhaps part of, of your growth was going through disappointments, that this was not what you expected, but you didn't give up. You continued yeah. your journey. Um, yes. So let's continue from there. What happened then? Okay, well, the second thing I was interested in um, was the ninja. And that had come around by a totally different um, means or origin for me. I'd grown up in a war zone and I'd had a little bit of an, uh, I'd had some experience at night in the darkness with a chap with an AK-47. So I had become very interested in, when, I, when you read about the ninja, how do these guys do this and why and how and so on. And so I was very attracted to that. But there was a second reason, and that is I'm not a big, strong guy. Well, I'm strong enough. But what I mean is I'm not six foot. And if someone comes charging at me with blades and all sorts of things, I, I, I'm going to be in trouble. So I began to think, what would I do? What does Noel do? What does anybody do? in a situation like this. And when I read the theory behind the ninja, I was very attracted to the total picture of strategy, uh, stealth, uh, trickery, et cetera, et cetera. So I said to Noel, why don't we head off to Japan and let's go and find the origin and find the people and let's go and do this. So we did. And we arrived in Japan and uh, we had chosen not to go. At that time, there's quite a bit of stuff coming out in the media. Um, so we chose not to go that route. We instead went to Otake Ritsuke, 
of the Katori Shinto Ryu. And we asked to have a meeting with him. And he, he was very kind. He, he had us uh, as guests at his um, uh, school and home. It's, it's all in one, more or less. So we had a cup of tea there. And he and Noel got on like a house on fire. Noel was a pretty young gal, but very respectful in the old ways. And she was educated in classic script. So the conversation very quickly ran away to the scrolls and to the history and to all of these things. And so that, that's a, a separate story. You can ask Noel about that in a minute if you want. But um, what he basically said to us, and this is, this is the, the jumping to the, to the end, is he said to us, listen, don't try and practice the full art of the ninja in Japan. It doesn't exist anymore. There is something, but it's not the full art. It's not what you want. Because we, we had asked specifically for the whole picture, what in, in Japanese is ninpo. And he said, you can find ninjutsu, which is, as he put it, the samurai used ninjutsu as a defense against the ninja or to understand how the ninja would attack, et cetera, et cetera. So for us, we looked at each other, chatted a little bit, and then we decided we'd go on this journey to have a look and see if inside the Chinese world we could find anything. And it was the origin of the ninja. So that's what we were going to do. So I leave that for there. You can jump in if you want. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Already you've said things that are really important. I think for any serious uh, martial arts researcher, there are some points there already beyond what the average person in the West today knows. I think they're, the, one of my observations of the human mind is that it loves the extremes. It loves to blindly believe everything the movies say, but if it's debunked, it loves to completely discard it. And it's hard for the mind to find the middle point, which seems to be what how nature is. Almost everything is in that middle point. And to me, it appears that your journey is a journey of finding the middle point. So the ninjutsu, the ninja art, the, the art of stealth may not be what we thought it was, but that doesn't mean there's not something there and there's an entire investment in finding what that was. I think that's true for most historical arts. You have to be comfortable with that in between. This is a great lesson from your life and how you've managed to do your research, to be comfortable with that, to not being driven by, for example, one could have given up and say, there's no Shaolin because you went to the Shaolin and it was not what you thought, but it doesn't mean there wasn't a historical one. What is that point of in between? And that's where the fascination lies for me. So you did this with ninja, the art of ninja. And to be honest, I didn't even know until you told me that the source of that would be in the Chinese arts, or at least an important source, and that some Japanese uh, so, uh, influences and sources would direct you that way. I think that's fascinating in itself. I don't know anyone who's had that depth already. So to be honest, that, that alone is already super intriguing. Um, so you were basically there meeting with these, these people and they said, you have to go back to China to understand the source of ninja. Is that the short story? Is that true? In essence, yes. Um, he said the full picture is not in Japan, but you may find it in China. And obviously, because of Noel, we may be able to right. find that. Well, he had no idea how difficult that journey was going to be. But in essence, he was right. And he did point in the right direction. So the pointer was helpful. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. That, that, so Noel, um, I have to tell you, this, and this, I can call myself anything, but without Noel, none of my journey means a thing. Because mm -hmm. Noel had this way with the masters. She was gentle and sweet and respectful and female. And she just did it the right way. And um, she would excuse me as a Westerner that I, if I make any mistakes, she would excuse yeah. and apologize for what we do. Now, sorry, I must tell you, with the Taki Ritsuke, he couldn't speak English, we couldn't speak Japanese. So Noel was writing mm. Chinese characters, and he was obviously reading the kanji. 
So mm-hmm. it took a while. We had to fumble around, but we found our way. And um, But Noel's understanding of the classic script is really key. And in no time, he had these scrolls out and we were looking at stuff because in the older Japanese script, as you probably know, it's very close to Chinese. And in the older reading, modern day Japanese struggle with it. Mm-hmm. And so he was very interested to ask Noel her opinion. Obviously, he's, he already has an idea of what he's doing. He's not stupid. But um, getting information from, from her perspective, and boy, that just opened doors, right, left, and center. It really was good. So, Noel, we have to thank you for that, for opening <laughs> the, the, the door of that discovery. And it may very well be still in the West, a complete, complete new concept and, and story would you two discovered following that. So the fact that you opened those, those doors for this to even be possible uh, is fascinating, right? I just followed the lead. He's always the leading, you know, he, he's got so many questions and ideas and I just follow the lead and then what I can assist in his quest so it's it's really it's his is is less quest to many questions in his you know in his uh, head about martial arts yeah so he spent his mostly his his thought is about martial arts so i would think a bit like yourself (laughs) you also think a lot about um like a history and then yes. what does it mean and what does this form does and what these techniques do and so yeah so for less it's even deeper than just the form of the techniques and actually the significance of this history and the culture which which is a lot more than most people that I um, heard um, when they just say about what their journey to martial arts um, yeah because Firstly, not just um, he interested just the martial art, but the culture significance, uh, the the link between the martial art and and culture. It's like one we cannot be separate from others. So, with the language, I can help him to you know um, decide a little bit more depth because the. Um, Chinese martial art, you, you, the language is a part, very important part of the picture. And, and if you do not understand the language, it's very hard to then understand the significance of just say even the technique, you know. So, yeah, so I'm just the, um, I'm just there to assist him. I'm not, he, he's, he's the one that you should ask him or he should one that say, say what is, is all about and yeah yeah i think she's been very humble there because it takes somebody with the background of classic chinese it takes the right attitude but but it takes a traditional mind and and a person who has practiced martial arts those are are too many things in one yeah and i could not have done it without her uh yeah i would think if i was much younger just say if i was uh like the millennial age, then probably wouldn't be so helpful to him <laughs> because I was, we were from the um, older era. Yeah, older era. Yeah. So in the 60s. Um, so we have, yeah, we brought up with a much more traditional uh, background. So, so that um, to go mm-hmm. back into search, uh, research in traditional way or understanding master and all this, it's not that um, far. It's not that alien, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Over to you. Can I highlight two things, Noel, that you said that are are so interesting, and for me, they have become themes of my daily thinking. One is the connection with culture and history. A lot of people may wonder why even that allure. So I'll just use a little bit of what you gave there to highlight uh, what happens. Um, And the other one is how you know, the, the respect, the right attitude in itself was a key to open doors. Much as we like to talk about martial arts today in modern times as physical science, 
you can't you cannot actually i believe you cannot actually understand the arts and have the impact they have in life without the attitude so this is in itself something that we can develop either later today or another day but i just don't think it's possible right now it, exactly so so maybe we'll get your take on that in a minute but this this point of the connection with the culture and the history i'm just going to say this and i apologize for injecting my little point of view, but no. it's actually out of the desire to amplify your point, Noel. You know, I was not looking to be interested in the history of the arts. When I got into martial arts, it was a very practical endeavor for me. But the way it changed my life, how much it gave me. You know, if you love someone, you want to know about their upbringing, their family. Nobody can tell me they love someone and they're not interested in their family and what, what they were like when they were little, even without going with that mindset, it just happens. And this art was so transformative in my life that I started to think, who came up with this? How did it happen that this program developed to come to me and change my life so much? And so this fascination for history was almost unexpected, the result of something that was beautiful. And, he, and so to me, he said, well, why are you just in history? I'm like, I don't think you can love something or someone and not be interested in the history. And this is something I never looked for. It just happened. So that's, that's that point you Very had, Noel, of the connection with the culture is wonderful. It's really what I think is unavoidable. It's when everything that's real comes from that context. So that's that's. That's great. So Les, so you took your bags and went back to China, right? Looking for the source of this art. We did. And that was the next 25 years that unfolded with us living in Hong Kong and going into mainland China, but also all over Southeast Asia. Um, it, everywhere, everything we just unpacked one by one. Um, it, it's been a horrific journey. You, you, you have to say that we're, we're extremists because mm -hmm. without, without having a kind of an, an extremist attitude, you really can't uh, do that type of uh, investigation. And boy, along the way, many times we wanted to stop. But if we stop, then what do we do? In, in a sense, in a strange way, it's given us a life's journey, something that keeps us off the streets mm -hmm. and, um, and, and doing something I, I suppose yeah. meaningful, you know. Become your purpose. Um... In in Japanese, it be, it's your ikigai, your, the th the reason that you get up every day and and do your thing, you know. So um, look, if we had to live life again, I, I would have to really ask a question of whether I'm going to go on this whole journey again because it really we feel we're feeling quite worn now. Um, but yeah, it's it's been good this time around. <laughs> yes, yes, because when when you were pointed back to China, that's a gigantic point back. So what do you? I can't even imagine. I can't even fathom what you did at that point. It's like going asking people, how do you find the source of what you're looking for? It's just unfathomable. That's too big, right? That's too. It big. is. It, the enormity of it was. We, we did. We went home very deflated. Okay, well, we're going to do China or the Chinese community now, which is massive. But how? And what are you going to do? Go around asking about who's a spy, who's a ninja? I mean, it's just impossible. Exactly. And and we were. We were laughed at. We were laughed at right, left, and center. Um, and we were much younger as well. So. We, yeah, we were laughed at and laughed off because we were younger. It was also we were dismissed uh, from many, many of the questions we asked, you know. Right. But the strange thing is, we're sitting here telling you, and we are the only two people alive today who know that the Chinese art of stealth actually existed and what it's composed of. Everyone else is gone now. So to, to just jump in there, we, we're actually trying to write a book about this. But the enormity of that is another leap because we've got to correlate 34 years of research and somehow put it into a book and explain in a manner that is palatable to people of what the heck this is all about, you know? So yeah, that's what we're up to. 
the vastness <laughs> of what you just said, it, I have little goosebumps right now of what, what you just said. It is true. It's not something people know. Nobody knows this. Would you, you, this, is, this is a jewel you have in your hands. It costs you your life to get to that. And now you're like, okay, this jewel, what do I do with this jewel? And you can't let it die. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it does feel like that. We, we're about 40% of the way through the book. So the second half should flow a lot easier. The first half is because we have um, a, a world that's enamored with ninja, but now the world's idea of the ninja is a bit twisted mm -hmm. and it's cartoons and it's anime, et cetera. You know, I mean, people don't realize that these things were real mm -hmm. and that 2005, 2700 years ago, we, we had people running around doing this and then all the way through right up until only, uh, it would have been just a hundred years ago now they were still there, still operating. And I mean, it's staggering. And how has it missed uh, our attention? How, we just don't know. We just don't know. We, we're exploring it all the time. And, and there's just so many questions. Could maybe the nature of it, and now I'm completely speculating and I don't know enough to do that. So I ask forgiveness. Uh, or before even uh, committing the deed. But perhaps the fact that it is some sort of art of stealth and not necessarily to the interest of the practitioner to be well known had to do with the fact that it's actually very hard to find records and it wasn't very open. I'm not really sure, but it, it could be, I'm sure you know, if that's related to why it's just so virtually unknown. Well, that's definitely part of it. And, and the second part of it was there's no label to it. And, and that's the part that we actually struggled with because yeah. we, we had to look through the history yeah. books for the action rather than the person. Yeah. yeah. You, yeah. You, like you say, the concept of the modern concept, you have a name attached to a figure. But throughout history, thousands of years of his, history in China, and this, this operative would be nameless and formless because just like the modern people that go out and do those um, work, they will not be named or, yeah. um, you know, they'll be very, very quiet and people, only the inner circle will know about it, but then people that do that job would not be like glorified or anything like that as well, yeah. because some of those are really, yeah. Dark, uh, yeah, some of it's very dark indeed. Yeah, and yeah, and then if, if they do record in the history, will be uh, events who got um, assassinated quickly, but will not be in details of who did it or or like let's say, let's say it, there is no um, a name attached to a unit. Just say it just gonna be quite fluid. No. So, so you're never going to be perusing through the book and then suddenly, oh, there's John Smith and he attacked, he was a ninja and he killed so -and -so. It doesn't yeah. come up like that. And also, if you know the culture of the Chinese people also is, is very different to, because the ninja's term has come from Japan, which is completely different to the Chinese, the culture and the mentality of the Chinese people were very, very different. So. So the, the, so the make people understand what the Chinese self and the, what the operatives are like, people would, would very quickly connect, but it's not like that. It's not like the Japanese one. Right. Of course it's not like, because we had those couple of thousand years ago, <coughs> um, the Japanese ninja was like much, much more uh, uh, later, later. A thousand later. years later, yeah. So um, you can't, how do you say, you, you can't back with, um, you can't talk about the, 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 the new to the, connect to the old. Yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean? You can't come you forward. You can't to, trace back. You can't come forward to, to, to present and say the past is not valid because you don't understand it. Right. Well, that was as clear as mud, but hopefully you understand. <laughs> I understand. I understand. I understand in my limited understanding, you're using something modern that's not, 
it's a thousand years separated from what you're looking for, and it's barely a ref in reflection in a muddy swamp, and that's your only clue to find yeah. something way more ancient that ends up being a series of practices that existed and recorded, but you don't even know what to call them to even look for them. You don't even know the name in Chinese. What you would search? What what? Yeah. Yeah. So you're looking for examples of. Invisible pe people that were able to do stealthy things like climbing walls. And it's like, how do you find? It's just an incredible thing. It, it's, wow. you know, what you said earlier of there were many times in your journey that you wanted to give up. I, I can see how miraculous it was that you continued. So, so for some sort of se sequence of events, you ended up at the door of someone who had something to teach you. How did that happen? So the first thing we discovered that was of, of um, major use to us was that these skills were still alive. Now, we're talking about when we were young. They're not alive now outside of what you're looking at. And, and please, I'm not stating that we are amazing practitioners or anything. I'm simply stating that because we dig around, we find. Anyway, um, we discovered that these skills are real. And in fact, I, I will now semi-contradict myself. They do exist today in mainland China, but not as a single whole. So you can find certain people that have gecko kung fu. Mm -hmm. In other words, the skills of running up and down walls mm -hmm. and corners. Now, there are people with that. And so you can go and learn gecko if you're lucky, if they'll teach you. And... But then the next question is, well, what about running roofs and walls? Because that's once you're up off the, the ground level, you've got to get onto the roofs. Who's going to teach you that? So, and there's many different skills involved with that type of thing. Um, so some of the individual skills existed, but not the, the total. So we start asking around and someone says to us, you need to go and speak to that man his name was Guan, uh, Guan Yun Cheng. He was our Sifu, that's uh, in Cantonese. And he will teach you something. And I, all we wanted to do at the time was learn something with the sword. And Guan Sifu said, okay, come, we'll learn the sword and we'll be friends. And we said, well, we won't be friends. You are our Sifu. And that's how we will handle this. Mm -hmm. And... Um, this is where our relationship was quite good because I could be a little bit cheeky as a Westerner and pretend that I'm, oh, I didn't know there was a boundary, a cultural boundary there, sorry. <laughs> and then Noel would quickly smooth it over and we'd weasel <laughs> so I'll away. be the respectful Chinese uh, student. He will be the, um, lots of questions. The Western, idiot foreigner. <laughs> Western, Westerner asking also the question that, even once you have to like, okay, let me think about what I did when I was 11 years old or, you know, what my sibu told me. So he, he even, even Guan Sifu has to dig in his memory to answer questions from like, when, when Les asks us, like, I don't know what you call those questions. <laughs> Just yeah. come from nowhere. We, as you know, we, we don't, we don't ask those questions as, right. um, as the Asian. We just learn from the Sifu listen to the story, whatever. If we have question, we just kind of in our head just to think this question out. Otherwise you don't you don't want to ask a dumb question from to, to your teacher. That's the that's the Asian way. You don't ask a question without spending a lot of time, maybe years to think about, see if you can figure mm -hmm. out the answer before you just like blah blah blah. So but for like if Liz have a question come into his head at that moment he would just ask and see if we has to then okay, that is like, see, then he have to think right. for an answer. And then if he doesn't know, he'll just say, no, I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I've got a quite a good video um, scene of Sifu and there's the back of my head and Sifu shaking his finger at me like he's had enough, you know. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, sometimes he's like, ah, I like Taito. <laughs> he would say, um, he, he call him in, in Chinese, Alec is his nickname. So call him uh, Alec. And then he say, don't ask so many questions, just practice. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So he would, he, yeah. and then he would just go practice a bit. But then very quickly, then there'll be another question, you know. So for, for me, you see, it was always important that martial arts works. And in the Chinese culture, there's uh, three parts of Shaolin, let's say. Let's go from there. Chan, Wu, and Yi. Chan is spiritual. Uh, Wu is martial. And Yi is medical. So those three have drifted into the culture. And Kung Fu now is any part of that. So a lot of people practice martial arts. Well, sorry, all people practice martial arts for different reasons. But in my concept, I wanted to make sure that whatever I was practicing was going to end up like a killing machine. And then you can take the philosophy with it to not be the killing guy, you know. But so, so that's why I used to press at these questions. Uh, sorry, we haven't gone off topic, have we? No, no that's one. The, this is the topic. It's perfect. It sounds like your strategy. Go off the, go off the track quickly. <laughs> The way you combined your attitudes worked as a wonderful strategy to draw more out of your Sifu. It worked very well. And how is it? So, I mean, it's very difficult to explain this. And I don't know if it's possible to put in words, but you ended up learning from a man who indeed had the knowledge of this art you were looking for. Is there a way to describe just maybe just uh, superficially? How is it that historically that was possible? What, what was his background to be able to have that knowledge and pass it on to you? Okay, well, that was probably the biggest surprise of our life. We, so I told you, you can't follow a person. So you're not going to look into the history books and look for a ninja. It's not going to exist. It's like looking for a ghost. So then you look for the action in the history books and you can find some of that. However, then you see the art exists in pieces. How does it get to somebody? And, and this is the part that exploded in our heads. The art of stealth was available to all kinds of people. So if I may, I'll just give you a brief history. Is that, is that too long to say that? Absolutely not. Please go ahead. That's wonderful. So the brief history is this. 2,700 years ago, in China, you've got a group of thieves. And these thieves are operating in the capital. Those thieves utilize their position. I don't want to say too much. It must come out in the book. They utilize their position and are largely operating on rooftops. Now that's to do with the walled cities being enclosed and so on and blockaded. Mm -hmm. So hence you have the stealth up on the roof, you have silence operating in the night, etc. But they inadvertently discover, oh, if I look through the tiles, I'm actually looking down on the guy who runs the city, the mayor or whatever, you know, and this guy, I can listen to his secrets. And these secrets are worth more money than stealing someone's handbag. Mm -hmm. And so this whole thing develops. And the next thing, these group of thieves are being used in strategic warfare. So um, there's a walled city, we need information and so on. So now, the military obviously try to use that very quickly and over time the military have gone in and out with with stealth okay long story however as we get towards the Qing dynasty now we've got foreign invaders who are in china and the, the Qing have taken china they own china the only thing the chinese people can do is to revolt from inside so they turn to whoever they can and the art of stealth can come out by then because, okay, we need to get our country back. And so we find in the Qing dynasty, there's all manner of people that have acquired the skill of stealth. Now, I'm keeping something back here because remember what Otake Ritsuka said, there's ninjutsu and ninpo. Mm. In Chinese, you have... Uh, the um, 
how can I describe it? You have the greater and the lesser art. Mm -hmm. Lesser art is used by the military and it's a skill that anyone can acquire. I can learn to hide, I can learn to run, I can, it's simple. But to live the way of yin fa is a much bigger picture. So we just leave that aside. So this yin kung, the, the skill of hiding, was quite widely used in the, in the Qing dynasty to fight against the Qing oppressors, etc. So Guan Sifu's lineage, our lineage, actually comes from a line of bodyguards. Mm -hmm. um, you, uh, bodyguards is a strange word. In, you know, in, the, in the, the Qing dynasty, we had those huge uh, bodyguard trains. Um, people have various, they call them security companies and all sorts of things. They were like mini arms, really. Mm -hmm. They had to have intelligence. They had to have forward information whenever they were taking valuables. And that is where the art of stealth came in. And that blew our minds because now we discovered, oh, hang on, the art of stealth is not necessarily by some evil guy. Mm -hmm. There's different types. And so it was through that that we managed to get a snippet. And then it was, as Noel said earlier, we had to pry the rest out of Guan Sifu because to be honest, he'd forgotten a lot of it. And he was sitting there saying, whoa, hang on, I was young when I mm -hmm. did that. Right. You know? But also, like you say, he, like it's like me, when he does those, um, when he learned the art, it's just uh, as a boy playing mm -hmm. with his with his brothers, yeah. Kung Fu brothers. It's not a, by then it's not a use as a um, skill to do something. It just become, you learn the skill as a young boy and grow up with your brothers and your, your Kung Fu brothers and just play around. And, so in, in, in that sense that we don't take it, well. As, as kids, you don't take it yeah, seriously. As kids, you it, it's like you playing basketball in America. Every just, kid goes out and plays basketball. Yeah. But when do you take it seriously, you know? Small so for them, it's the same, but, they, but they end up with incredible skills. Yeah, we, we see the skill, it just thing that you, you do and you little and you, you, you know, when you grow up, you got the skill, but everyone say, oh, yeah, you got great skill. But then to myself, then I say, oh, yeah, they're just average, you know. So <laughs> that's the thing. Yeah. So then one day, Guan Sifu, um, probably the most memorable day of my life uh, was uh, my Kung Fu life, that is. Um, Guan Sifu came on a Sunday, and he contacted us and said, oh, I'm coming, uh, we're going to go out. What? We never do this. Definitely. What are you talking about? Then we're going to have lunch. So he picked us up and off we went. Be careful you don't go off the camera. <laughs> and off we went. And he'd arranged for us to meet all kinds of his Kung Fu brothers. And we met guys that were coming out of the woodwork that we, you know, this guy has this skill, that guy has that skill, yeah, that guy has that skills. skill. Wow. And then started coming out all the old documents. And over the years, Guan Sifu gave us hordes of documents. He gave us, uh, or he got us access to the Qin Wu record. He, uh, through that, we got access to the Shanghai Qin Wu record. Mm. It just went on and on and on and on. And um, so anything that Guan, Guan Sifu was a, a very cool Sifu. Um, if it's something he didn't know, he just told you, I don't know. Mm -hmm. It was not one of these, I'm going to make a bullshit yeah. and you're going to suck it in and I'm going to, you know, it wasn't like that. He would try and find the answer. If he couldn't get the answer, he'd find someone else who did. And because of that, we just, we, we got this fantastic thing going. And then we started meeting with one of his brothers, his Kung Fu brothers, who used to come down on a Sunday after that. You remember Tao Sifu? Mm -hmm. And he used to bring these texts with him. Oh, have you got this one? Have you got this yeah. one? And then he'd give me a copy of something else. He loved to collect the um, cream pole. Yeah. So he'd collect all the cream pole, the, uh, what's the, what's, what's cream Like the pole? rhyme um, for the Kung Fu. The, yeah, the, form. The, each form has a rhyme to it so that you can remember it, but it has meaning to it. It's called a cream pole. 
he would collect those yeah. for the most abstract forms you ever imagined. Yeah, <laughs> and he would, you know, hundreds and hundreds of forms. And he would, uh, anyway, he started with that. And then I would say, you haven't got this book or that book or whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah, he has a copy, he has a copy. And he just, he just gave us so much. Mm. And through his contacts as well, we then got access to Qing manuscripts. And uh, it just spiraled from there. That's how we found our way in like worms. <laughs> you worked so hard for it. And it also appears contextually based on your description. You were many years under your, your Sifu. So he also, I think as a Sifu, knows how much to give as you prove your, your worth and your loyalty and the fact that you're there for real and for the long haul. <laughs> yeah. How many people really interested in this? So I think for someone... You know how what they say in martial arts, but also in the spiritual teachings, like it's not that there aren't enough teachers, there aren't enough students. Because there That's aren't people that are interested. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. To yeah. find a good student is very difficult. Exactly. So you your life through you show you showed your determination. And for a teacher that has this, to have someone to pass it on is, is also a very meaningful thing, but it has to be the right person. Yeah. Well, hopefully we were that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In, in, in truth, sorry. sorry yeah, absolutely. Up. Go ahead. In truth, Guan Sifu didn't want to pass on the yin fa, the art of stealth to us. Guan Sifu was more interested in Shaolin. Mm -hmm. And in our lineage, we have, believe it or not, a Shaolin monk and three other guys. Now, the three other guys were into the more dodgy stuff. But the Shaolin monk, right in the beginning, he's the one who brought the Zen at the, the path of uh, less violence and so on. So what has become very interesting is, and I know this is going to sound bizarre, but even in Shaolin, there is an art of stealth inside Shaolin. I don't think it exists today. There, there are elements of it, but it's there. And so the further back and the deeper you go, you find that martial arts in the old times were not styles. They were not separated by, oh, you do Wing Chun and we do this and she does mm -hmm. that. It, it was not like that. Mm -hmm. You were brothers in arms. You learned whatever you could to stay alive. And martial arts was not kicking and punching. It was about poisons and knives and all sorts of nasty things. Sorry to interrupt you. That's, that's perfect. In fact, I remember... Um, I think this is an interesting thing for listeners to hear and perhaps for us to develop another day, but to what you just said, I've shown you things even that I do. And you know, in many martial arts, there's this thing of putting the hand here and it's, it's like a proxy for death, but people don't ask themselves, this is not deadly. I just put my hand here and you said, well, it would be if you had a poison needle right there, right? And it seems like we have gotten these practices, but people are not, we're not asking ourselves, what is it like that? And all of a sudden it makes sense. Or if I had a dagger that was, it would make perfect sense all of a sudden, you know, an art that I can get in and, and put that in, in yeah. an enemy or something. Yeah. So you ended I up learning Shaolin. Sorry, go ahead. I think our time is up. Are you okay? Oh, yes. Um, we can, yes. I'm going to say this for the listeners. Uh, Les and Noel have too much to give us. It would be a shame to just have them one time. I am going to respectfully ask him, uh, ask them to maybe come regularly, perhaps if we can do it um, monthly or whenever our schedules permit. But there is so much to go deeper. And I know from my conversations with Les, there's so many aspects of this that have to do with martial arts and history, the Shaolin, the weapons, you know, the, the, the relationship to society. It would be fascinating. And I would kindly ask you to come back another day and we'll continue uh, developing these topics. Would that be acceptable? We would be honored. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's been fascinating. Do you want to tell the, the listeners how to get in touch with you if they want to know more? Uh, we have a, I have a research site. It's a slightly out of date, not, not grossly out of date. Uh, it's called uh, ForgottenSword.com. And uh, there should be ways of getting hold of me through there. That'll lead you on to Facebook and so on. Perfect. I will put that in the show notes. 
Uh, are there any last thoughts that I, perhaps through my questions, did not give you a chance to share with the listeners? Okay. Not all good. Thank you very much. I am delighted. This has been one of the most important moments of my career, to be honest, because I, I sense, I think you're, you're hearing on something that we cannot um, overemphasize, the importance of this jewel that you have. And with your permissions, we'll continue exploring it in upcoming episodes. For now, over and out. Uh, and thank you so very much. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.